All right. Let me pull the file back up. All right. And then let me spread you guys out so I can see you. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so parallelism, right, is typically in a he verse, you'll have this parallelism where I can't remember where I got cut off, but uh, maybe you have two, three, or four lines in a poem, and those, those lines are connected to each other somehow. In Hebrew poetry, that connection can be a repetition of the idea of the first line or a contrast to the first line or in some way a development and adding to or illustrating that first line. So that's common in Hebrew poetry, especially in the Psalms. All right? Not all Hebrew poetry has parallelism in it. Okay, some of the prophetic passages, you won't, you'll see imagery and you'll see terseness, but you may not see parallelism. So don't assume it's in every, every type of Hebrew poetry. It is in, it's very common in the Psalms, extremely common in Proverbs. Um, and then outside of those two books, like in Job, Ecclesiastes, the, the prophets, sometimes you'll see parallelism when they use poetic language, but not all the time. All right. So just keep that in mind. But in the Psalms and Proverbs, we should typically we'll see it in almost every verse. All right. We'll go more into detail on that um, as we move forward. But let's just remind ourselves quickly. There were uh, five types of Hebrew parallelism, three primary ones. Can, you, can anyone uh, give, me, give me one out of the five synonymous the right. synonymous parallelism synonymous right and that's where the the second line second line uh repeats repeats the first or is a similar yeah. idea synonymous idea mm -hmm. all right um pastor renee what's another type of parallelism that we've seen in hebrew poetry Did he hear you? The antithetical. Yeah, uh, antithetical or contrasting. I yes, think, right? contrasting. Some say antithetical, but antithetical's, you know, that's that's too big a word for me. So I, I prefer something like contrasting, right? Where the second line mm. contrasts the first. Mm -hmm. All right. Sometimes you'll see words like but or something like that in the line. A third type. A little more difficult. Brother Harris, you remember a third type of parallelism that we've seen in Hebrew poetry? Um, uh, the one with, in which the second line explains or develops the idea of a third thing. Very good. Third Developmental. Thing. Yeah, very good. All right. Developmental, which uh, the, the second line develops the first. And there are three ways that it does that. One way is, as, as Brother Harris mentioned, uh, expands or adds. Another way is it illustrates or explains. And then a third way is it gives the, the purpose or the result. The result. Okay. Now, uh, there's another type of parallelism that, in the books, I think we called it formal or miscellaneous, or uh, mm -hmm. those of those of you that you know speak Sabuano, we we called it ambut. Um, <laughs> so it just I don't know, you know. So sometimes <laughs> we'll read a verse and we we'll just we won't know. So we just uh, in Cebu we just said ambut, you know, that's unknown. Uh, but that's not typical. Ninety-five plus percent of the verses we look at uh, in scripture that have parallelism, we'll be able to identify it, all right? And then a, f a certain type of parallelism we call was chiasm, which can't usually be synonymous, sometimes contrasting, and we'll mm. talk more about that. It's where the second line, uh, the second line is in reverse order grammatically compared to the first. Okay, so the, the word order is intentionally switched, um, mm. and it's exactly in reverse. You can think of it kind of like maybe the idea of uh, the second line mirrors 
Mm -hmm. first. You know, in a mirror, when you look at a mirror, the mm -hmm. image is flipped. So like if you hold up your mm -hmm. right hand in a mirror, it looks like it's your left hand that you're holding up. Mm -hmm. So chiasm is kind of like that. The second line mirrors the first. And that's an intentional um, word order by the author because he's intending to highlight, emphasize something, all right? We'll get into that more uh, probably next, next week as well, but I at least wanted to, to expose us and remind us of these, these things. Okay, so um, we just answered that. Now, when we talk about imagery in Hebrew poetry, Poetic devices are what's used to develop imagery, uh, to convey emotion. Can you guys remember any of the poetic devices, the figurative language, figures of speech? Uh, those would be some other terms that I used in class. Do you remember some of these? Um, can, can anybody recall any of these types of uh, figures? The of simile. Good, simile. All right where it's one thing is as or like another. Anyone else remember? Metaphor. 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 Good. That's where, uh, you know, one thing is another. It's described as another. Any others come to mind? Hypothesis. Oh. <laughs> we have a Hebrew <laughs> scholar among us. <laughs> Hypocatastasis. All right, and that's, that's an even stronger comparison. These first three are, are uh, types of comparisons we, we see in poetry. I, okay, good. Any others that come to mind? Hyperbole. Good, hyperbole, right? Exaggeration. Any others? Personification. Good, personification. Or, uh, a human feature is attributed to a non-human object. Trees clapping, the mountains shouting, things like that. Any others come to mind? Anthropomorphism. Oh, okay. Now we're really getting, I can't even spell that one. Morphism. <laughs> Where human characteristics used of God. So, because um, God doesn't have human features, but there are passages which describe him as having a hand or the eyes of the Lord or, or, or God, um, uh, you know, looking or the, the, the uh, finger of God, things like that. There's another type that's similar called zoomorphism. Yeah. What, what is that describing? Animal attributes are given to persons. Yeah, animal attributes um, uh, describing, uh, typically describing the Lord. So the wings of God or that kind of thing. But yeah, it can also be a human, you know, he flew away. Uh, well, humans don't fly, but it's sort of describing, giving an animal characteristic or trait. Okay, good. These are just some examples. We'll, we'll go through the whole list together and do some examples together in a couple of weeks. But just trying to stir your thoughts towards poetry, right? You're all, you're all with me now, right? Hebrew poetry. It's coming yeah. back to me now. I can feel it, right? Okay, good. All right, so these are some uh, poetic devices, the figurative language. There are some other kinds of poetic devices. Pastor Entz mentioned one earlier. Very common in Hebrew poetry, mm -hmm. repetition, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, among the most common types of poetic devices used in Hebrew poetry, it's repetition. All right, there's also things called refrain, um, inclusio, mm. which we'll cover um, a little bit later as well. So, all right, so these are all the kinds of poetic devices that a, that a poet will use in order to convey emotion, to convey emphasis, to, to point and direct our attention to certain features in the poem to develop images. Uh, these are all the sorts of ways that the, the poets will do that, okay? Any questions so far? Hopefully this is stirring your, your uh, memories a little bit. I know it may seem like vague memories for some of us because it was a while back, but um, these are the, 
kinds of important features of Hebrew poetry I wanted to, to cover with you guys. Now, um, let me go to this. This should look sort of familiar to you guys. Does it look a little bit familiar, this figure here? Um, let me expand yep. it a little bit if I can. This is a picture which sort of represents the entire process from exegesis okay. to exposition, from text to sermon. All right, and the, the upper portion here, this top half um, of the figure, the funnel shape is the exegetical portion, the, the study, um, the specific steps of study that are involved in studying a passage. And here, uh, these steps are going to be essentially the same for any type of genre, except this middle step, poetic analysis. That fourth step is going to change depending on the kind of genre you're studying. But every other step is going to be the same, all right? But if we're looking at narratives, that fourth step will be narrative analysis. We do things specific to stories, um, prophetic analysis. There are certain features in prophecy that we have to consider when we study prophetic books. But every other book, every genre is going to have essentially the, the exact same flow of study except that fourth step. Uh, okay, so that's what we're going to give a lot of emphasis to here in this in this workshop together is that fourth step. But the first three steps is the same for essentially almost every book of the Bible. All right. The first three steps are focused on the book as a whole. All right. And studying the book as a whole. If you guys can remember, right, we want to understand what's the author doing with this book? What's his the purpose of the book? Why did he write the book? How did he... Um, put the book together, mm. right? And that's what these first three steps cause us to, to mm -hmm. do, is first we read through the whole book, make observations, read through it several times to get familiar with it. The second step is to identify the background context of the book. Now, who can tell me what's in, involved in the background context? When I, when I say that, what do I mean? What are we looking for in the background context? Story in the sun. I'm sorry. Satan, go ahead. Uh, there is a corresponding story that uh, is the basis of the psalm or a um, historical background of the psalm. Yeah, and right now I'm just talking about, in general, any kind of book from the Bible, not specifically the psalms yet. Okay. But, just, um, but yeah, it's, it's the historical background of a particular book. Uh, when was it written? What time period does it cover in the writing, if you're looking at a, a narrative? Uh, what else? Tabs, you were going to say something? Pastor, were you asking the background context well, from, the, from the specific book that, uh, were, that, that is being studied? Yeah. I'm, if, it's, if it's just from the, based on the passage or the book, um, we can see it from, if it's a letter, we can get the background context from either the greeting or the opening verse from the narrative. We can see the background or context from the setting, things like that. Yeah, and we're just looking at the first three steps um, mm. are, let me see here if I can. My screen's frozen. Hold on a second here. Mm. I'm having trouble here with me. There we go. Now, again, the first three steps, the first step is these are all book level. All right? Meaning yeah. we're, the book as a whole. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking at first. Before we dive into mm -hmm. a passage, we look at the book. Okay? Right. And so the first step is, you know, read the book, the whole book. Mm -hmm. And the idea is several times just to get familiar mm -hmm. with the book. And then added to that, you start making some observations. That's just questions that come to your mm -hmm. mind, patterns you see, mm -hmm. just things that stick out. Um, the second mm -hmm. step is then you examine the background context, again, of the whole book. Mm -hmm. So that's going to include features like, um, as was mentioned, what's the historical background of the book? Okay, when, mm -hmm. when was it written? 
um, you know, in particular, or what, what time period does the book cover? So for example, you know, for doing the, the book of Ruth, um, the time period that the book covers is in the time of the judges. Remember the first line of the book in the days of the judges in the days when judges judged. So, but the book was written probably after it was written after that because it describes mm. David at the very end of the book. Right. So mm. we know that it was written mm. at least in the days of David, maybe even after that. Mm. All right. Um, what, what other features when we talk about historical background or uh, background context, what are some other types of why, why the book was written? What for uh, what purpose uh, the book was written for? Yeah, and this is a key uh, feature that we want to try to understand. Why did the author write this book? And as I, if you probably remember me saying many times in class, if you don't know why the author wrote the book, you're not ready to mm. preach the text. Um, mm. You've got to know how does my passage fit in this book? Okay, mm. you've got to be able to answer that question because this is going to authorial intent, right? We're after... Mm. We're after the author's intent. What, what did the Holy Spirit, um, along, you know, in conjunction with this human author, what was the intent? What were they wanting to communicate? Whether it was in the form of a story or in the form of a poem or in an epistle um, uh, or a prophetic text, what was the author wanting to communicate? Why is he saying these things? Why is he giving us this story? All right. Um, so that's, that's key, the purpose of the book. Um, another aspect is the occasion of the book. Mm. What prompted it to be written? Now, for epistles, usually mm. it's a little easier to figure that out. You know, we, as uh, was mentioned a moment ago, you know, from looking at the introduction to the letter or aspects in the letter, we can determine, you know, what, what caused the author to write this letter. It's a little harder when we get to narratives, um, figuring out what prompted the author to write this narrative? Now in Ruth, very interesting story. As we dig into that story, you know, at the very end, remember that genealogy? Mm. That's expressed right at the end, uh, the, the generations from Perez to David. And you're reading this wonderful love story, right? About Boaz and Ruth and, and how God took care of Naomi and provided for her and they get married. And, you know, it's this wonderful, wonderful love story, it seems. But then you have the end of the book with this genealogy. So it kind of is a, uh, an odd way to end the book. You know, this wonderfully written story that's very moving. And then all of a sudden the book ends with, you know, to Perez was born this guy and then this guy and then this guy. And, so you have to ask yourself, why did the author do that? Well, it helps to, uh, us to understand his purpose in writing the book uh, of Ruth. All right. And I won't go any further with that because that's a narrative. But just to give you mm -hmm. an idea or it's the same in a, in a poem. You know, what is the what uh, what prompted the poem to be written? And a lot of times we'll find that information within the poem. Sometimes we'll see a lot, sometimes not very much. All right, but as best we can, we want to be able to try to answer what, what caused this poem to be written uh, or book to be written, and then wh what is the purpose of the book. Those are two different things. The occasion is an event or situation that caused the author to write. The purpose of the book is the message that he wants to communicate. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. So, for example... Um, Right now, we're in the midst of this virus, uh, and so maybe, maybe there's a particular family in your church that um, either somebody has, has died from this virus or the family is just suffering a lot, and so you want to, to call them. Uh, now, what prompted the, the call is that you heard that they were going through a hard time with this virus, but maybe as you're calling them, your message to them is you want them to be comforted or encouraged. Okay, so the occasion of your phone call would be their situation and the, the virus, but the purpose of your phone call is maybe to express encouragement or to, to be a help to them. You see the, the mm -hmm. distinction there? Any yeah. questions on that? 
So occasion and purpose are, are two different things. They're usually connected together, um, but, but they're two separate aspects. Now, there's one key as part of a background context we haven't mentioned yet. Audience. Yeah, who's the, the audience? audience? Who's, the, who's the, the, the readership? Who's the book being written to? And then who's the one writing the book? Okay. Who's the author? Yeah. All right. We want to know, and we don't just want to know the author's name, but what is his situation? Uh, what is, uh, what do we, what do we know about him? Etc. Same with the audience. What is their situation? Etc. Okay. Um, any other aspects to the background context that you can remember? Uh, the culture, Pastor Tim. Very good. The culture. Uh, what do we know about the people being written to? What do we know about the culture of the author? Um, one, one important uh, story where this comes out is in the Samaritan woman. Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John 4, right? We have to know the cultural context of that story mm. to understand the importance of what happened there. Because when Jesus shows up and he's talking to this woman, um, by the way, she's referred to as the woman or the Samaritan woman throughout the passage. Her name is never given. And I think John does that in order to, to emphasize this point that Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. Okay, to, to grasp the impact of that and the 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 astonishing nature of that, you really have to understand the cultural context and the tension between Jew and Samaritan, as well as the, the attitude that Jewish men had towards women. And in this case, she was an immoral woman. And so that story, you have to understand the cultural context, as well as like the parable of the Good Samaritan. You won't get the parable, or at least you won't get the emotional impact of the parable if you don't understand the cultural context, okay? Mm. And that mm. is not just attitudes in the culture, but also cultural practices. You know, some Proverbs that we read are hard to understand if we don't know the culture, okay? Or, or a phrase like um, Psalm 2, kiss the sun, lest he become angry. Well, if we don't understand the culture, we don't know what he's talking about there. You, you mean kiss, kiss a man or he gets mad at you? Well, what is that talking about? Well, that's... It's not a romantic kiss, right? It's, a, it's an expression which conveys honor like you would kiss the hand or the foot of a king when you approached him. Mm -hmm. That was a cultural practice that if, if you don't understand that, you're going to miss the point. All right? And there, there's many, many examples, but cultural context is very important. All right? Anything else that comes to mind as far as background context? How about... This one, mm, yeah. The locations, right? What locations are mentioned in the in the book? Mm. This is very important as well because certain places might be mentioned, and if you don't know how the original audience mm. understood that place, you're going to miss a particular point that the author right is making. I think in class I used an example from Amos four about uh, when Amos called the the women. Uh, he was addressing some certain women uh, at, at that point in his message, and he called them cows of Bashan. Mm. And uh, Bashan is a place. And if you didn't know where that place meant, you might think that he was actually just calling them fat women. You know, right? You cows. Uh, in our culture, in American culture, if you call a woman a cow, that's what you mean. You're, you're saying she's fat. Not very, it's not very nice. Uh, but that what Amos was doing was he calling these women fat and actually he wasn't he was uh, Bashan was a loc a place where it was known for its rich uh, meadows it's uh, where cattle would go animals would go and be well fed and cared for pampered even and so he was really Amos was was calling these women cows of Bashan because it was a picture of they're very well off they're well cared for they're provided for and, and and with that provision they were oppressing other people all right so 
So the image he was trying to convey was different than how we might understand it. So let me make sure everybody's got their cells muted. I'm hearing some background noise here. All right. Okay. All right. So these are the kinds of things we're looking at the book as a whole. All right. And so we're looking at the background context. Now the third component uh, or third step is the literary context of the book. And if you remember the key phrase here is we, we're trying to understand the author's flow of thought. Okay. How does he piece together the book? It's the idea. So if it's a narrative, he has this story, then this story, then this story, then this story. How are they connected together? Or in an epistle. Remember, we had each paragraph. We would summarize each paragraph and to try to understand, okay, he, he made this point, then this point, then this point. How are they linked together? There's a flow of thought expressed there. All right. And so in a book, it's trying to piece together or structure the whole book. It's, it's more than just an outline. All right. It, at its core, it's, we're outlining the book, seeing the structure of the book overall. But we're trying to understand um, the links between each of the key parts of the book. So, for example, if you're studying Ephesians and chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, is that great expression of praise to God for his work in our salvation. But if you just said pray, Paul praises God. All right, that... That's not giving us his thought. That's just saying what he did. That's giving us the subject. But what does Paul praise him for? Now you're getting to the thought. And then the next paragraph is, is his prayer. But you don't just say Paul prays. We need it. What did he pray and why? All right. So when we're doing literary context, we're trying to understand not just the topic, but we're trying to understand the thought. Does that make sense? Not just the topic of the paragraph, but the thought, the author's thought or author's point. Okay? And it's the same when we're looking at a story. Okay, you have a particular story that is given, but, but we're not just interested in, okay, the story is Jesus and the woman at the well. Okay, that's the general description of it, but what, what's the point of that story? And how does that story fit with what comes after, which is the miracle that he performs in, in Galilee for healing, um, healing the royal official's son, if I remember correctly. All right. But what's the, it's more than just that. It's more than just Jesus speaks to the woman at the well, and then Jesus heals this royal servant, royal official's son. What's the point of those two stories? Because we're trying to grab the author's thought so that we can track that flow of thought all the way through the book. Okay. Are you guys with me so far? Is this bringing back terrible memories? <laughs> Hopefully they're good memories, but um, so these are the first three steps that we do for every book in the Bible, except one, which book would we not do these first three steps? Any ideas? The Psalms. Except the Psalms. Never they... Now, why, the Psalms. why is that? Why would we not be studying the background context of the book of Psalms or the literary context of the book of Psalms? What is unique about the well, Psalms? It's a compilation of, uh, from different authors, uh, different contexts so yeah these are all these are all independent mm. independent poems okay they're a compilation or a collection or a, a, another term used as an anthology meaning mm. yeah. meaning that there are simply a, yeah. a number of poems written by different authors authors over a different period of time that each have their own individual mm. contexts. Every poem 
has its own occasion, has its own purpose, has its own flow of thought, okay? Uh, it has its own historical background because each poem is independent, all right? Even David's poems, you know, half of the Psalms are written by David, but they're written at different times in his life, in different situations, um, and sometimes with a different audience in mind, all right? So, uh, but, but we don't collect all of those independent poems together and then try to, to, to understand that as a book with an overall purpose. You know, the, in the Psalms, they are all independent poems, each with their own purpose, okay? But the Psalms is the only book that we treat this way. Every other book of the Bible, even Proverbs, is written as a book with an overall purpose for the book and an occasion for the book with a particular author and a particular audience, okay? So we would do these first three steps here, um, read background context and then literary context. We do that for, whoops, sorry about that. Every book of the Bible except the Psalms, all right? Because every book of the Bible is a book. Now, trick question, what about Genesis? Would we study Genesis as a book in itself with a singular purpose for that book? It's kind of a trick question. Is Genesis an independent book? Or is it part of a bigger book? Okay. <laughs> Remember, um, oh. it's called the Book of Moses, correct? But not just Genesis is part of the Book of Moses. It is Genesis, Exodus, Exodus Leviticus, Victor Numbers, Vegas, and Deuteronomy. And Deuteron the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. Okay, the Pentateuch is one book. All right. Now, it's been divided into five books, um, mm. which each, each of those five do have a distinct theme and focus, but they're still part of one large book. Now, they're in five books because there were five scrolls. Not, the whole writing could not be contained on one scroll. It'd be too big. <laughs> You know, those poor priests, man, they weren't, you know, like strong guys. So they, you know, they could only carry a, a certain size scroll. Um, so the scroll, the Pentateuch was divided into five scrolls where each scroll was mm. titled based on the first line of the, the scroll, basically. So for Genesis, the idea of beginning. All right. Um, in the Exodus, it, it started with right the people were in egypt and and how they came out of egypt and and so each book genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy does have its own focus and you'll see a particular theme like leviticus the focus is the holiness of god exodus the focus is how god should be worshiped genesis we call the book of beginnings because it lays the foundation for humanity but also and more importantly lays a foundation for the people of israel right i mean remember most of genesis is focused on just four men abraham isaac jacob mm. and joseph mm. 39 chapters are dedicated to those men 11 chapters are dedicated to you know the the beginning of human history so keep this in mind when you're studying the one of the a passage from the Pentateuch, keep in mind, it's not just, let's say you're studying Genesis, you know, six. It's not just the book of Genesis you got to keep in mind, but you got to keep the whole Pentateuch in mind as well. All right. Just keep, mm -hmm. keep that um, uh, idea. Uh, same thing. First and second Samuel is one book. Mm, one book. It got divided again, the size of the scroll, and also, too, the Septuagint, I believe, split up some of these books, and I don't remember why they did. First and Second Kings, one book. First and Second Chronicles, and Chronicles, one book. Ezra, Nehemiah, one book. All right? So when you're studying these first three steps and you're looking at the book, remember to consider the whole book. All right? Ask yourself, is this book that I'm studying 
part of a bigger book. Now, all, you know, all the books are part of the Bible, the big book, but that's not what I'm talking about here. It's just consider, you know, if you're studying Second Chronicles, it's part of a, a book first and Second Chronicles. Okay? Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. All right. Uh, Any Pastor Tim, thoughts we, or questions? Yeah. yeah. Can we consider that also in the New Testament, like the first and second Thessalonians, although different time frame in terms of giving the letter, but same audience, same author? Well, um, good question. Uh, so we have books in the New Testament, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, first and second and third John. Um, in those cases, those were not letters written together they're independent mm. letters but oh, yeah. they're just referred to that way because it is the same author but first yeah. timothy and second timothy both books are written by paul to timothy but they're written at different points in time with a different occasion and a different purpose okay mm. first timothy was written to give timothy instruction on how one is to conduct conduct himself within the church of god he says so in 1 Timothy 3.15. Mm. Second Timothy is a personal letter between Paul to Timothy. Mm. It's his last letter that he's written, and it's his final words to Timothy in regards to carrying out the ministry he's been given because Paul is about to die. And so mm. each book, you know, those two books are strongly connected only because it's the same author and the same recipient, but mm. they have a different purpose, different occasion, written at different times okay the same can be said for first and second peter peter same author writing to the same audience by the way in each book but each book has a different focus all right first peter his focus is on how they are to stand firm in christ mm -hmm. even while enduring trials and persecution okay whereas second peter he writes as sort of a reminder uh, he says, I'm writing these things by way of reminder because he wants to, them to, to remember what he said about the second coming because there were false teachers trying to upset the church and they were spreading heresy about primarily about the second coming, but about several doctrines regarding the end time. So Peter writes the second letter to remind them what he had told them before in regards to uh, Jesus' second coming. And their need to live in light of that. Um, okay, so same with First, Second Thessalonians. Same author, same audience, but two distinct letters with two distinct occasions and two distinct purposes, written at different times. Okay, but when you're talking about mm -hmm. First and Second Kings, those actually were originally one book that just were split up into two later in our translations. But we need to to recognize they're part of one book with one overall purpose. And so when you read those two books, remember to, to keep them as one book in your, as you're studying. Okay. Does that make sense? Everybody. Mm. Did, was that yeah. pastor Rance? I don't know who asked that question. Did I answer the question? I think that I think it was Jason. Was that Jason? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Thank you for the tip also with First and Second Peter and doing a series with that. Also. Oh, okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah, I just taught out taught Second Peter to uh, a group of women in our church uh, a couple months ago. And uh, it's, it's so important to recognize, you know, again, what the purpose of that letter you're studying is and, and understanding that it, it is distinct and, and uh, independent from the first letter, the first Peter, but there is a connection because he says several times in second Peter, I want to remind you, I want to stir you up by way of reminder. So there is a link, another link, Luke and Acts. Mm. Actually, uh, those are two books, but they're strongly linked together. And in fact, the purpose for the book of Luke directly ties into the purpose of the book of Acts. All right, and remember how Luke begins, where he tells Theophilus that he wants to set down in consecutive order all that took place regarding Jesus so that he would know for certain the truth, right? He'd have confidence. The book of Acts, do you remember how that begins? He says, in, in my first book that I wrote to you, Theophilus, 
Um, so it's a continuation of the book of Luke. And I like to think of it sort of really as the work of the Spirit in the life of Christ is Luke. And then in Acts, it's the work of the Spirit in the church. Yeah. Because uh, the Spirit plays a prominent role in, in both of those books. So, uh, so that's another aspect, too, to keep in mind when you're studying Luke or studying Acts to remember there is a strong link to, to the book of Luke there as well. All right. Um, they aren't the same book, though, but they are written by the same author to the same audience as almost a volume one, volume two. You know, OK. Now, when we talk about Psalms, uh, the book of Psalms is is not a book in the same way. It's a collection. I, I would prefer to even call it the, a, the collection of Psalms so that we don't have that book uh, mentality. So, you know, that thinking that, okay, there's one author to the book of Psalms with one audience and one purpose. No, as we go through the Psalms, we see a lot of different kinds of poems, don't we? And uh, different occasions, different authors, different uh, purposes within each poem, a different style within each poem. And so they are all independent and unique, but they are similar as a form of genre. And so they were brought together under the... Uh, the same book, or I would again say collection would be a better term when we're discussing the Psalms. All right. All right. Long, long answer to a short question, which was, do, do these first three steps apply to the Psalms? How is the book of Psalms different? And we've been discussing that. All right. So we consider the, the Psalms as an ind a collection of independent poems. Now, before we move on, there are a couple of psalms, I believe, is it Psalm 9, where some scholars, or many scholars actually believe that Psalms 42 and 43 were actually one psalm, and that during the time of the Septuagint being written, the Greek translation, which was written about 200 years or so before Christ, that those two psalms got split up for some reason. And then some scholars believe Psalm 9 and 10 suffered the same fate. I don't know about that one for sure, but Psalm 42 and 43 do seem to be, have come from one psalm that for whatever reason got, got split up. So that's something you'll have to take into account if you're studying those two psalms. And the reason that, uh, the reasons for that, you know, without getting into all the details, they both share the same exact refrain. They both share the same exact uh, occasion or purpose for writing the psalm. Um, there are also some uh, uh, grammatical and uh, style features that are very similar between the psalms. And they happen to be next to each other in the Psalter. Uh, so... Again, I won't go into all the details there, but just something to think about. I think those would be the only two psalms I would have a strong view that, that probably should be connected together as one psalm. I'm not so convinced on some of the other options that have been thrown out there. But for the most part, almost, almost all the psalms you, you will treat as and study as independent psalms. Now, the psalms have been collected together uh, Often, you know, again, it's a collection. So there was some people involved, you know, there was the original author to the psalm, right? So David writes a psalm, particular situation, and inspired by the, uh, the Spirit of God, and he writes this psalm down, and then another and another, and he's got this collection of psalms. Well, men later on would take that collection from David. There's some psalms from Solomon, one from Moses, from sons of Korah, uh, from... Um, uh, Ethan from uh, Asaph and they collected gathered them together and organized them in a certain way so sometimes you will see psalms grouped together that share a particular theme or style or author all right but that doesn't mean that they're intended to be you know part of a book you know chapter one two and three but sometimes they're just collected together because they share a similar theme or a style or, or author or something like that. So, for example, Psalms 146 to 150, they're all focused on praise the Lord. Um, Psalm uh, 115 to 118 were 
or no, sorry, 113 to 118 were called the Hallel Psalms, which were recited during Passover. Um, you have a group of Psalms written together uh, around in the 70s that were all written by Asaph. They were collected together because of a common author. Okay? So, keep that in mind as well. But that does not mean that those Psalms need to be interpreted together because the the person that collected those psalms wasn't inspired. Only the, the psalm itself through the original author was inspired. How they were ordered was not. All right, that was just some people that came along later, maybe saw uh, commonality or similar themes and just thought that collect group the psalms in a certain order. Okay, any questions on this? Comments? We're all okay? All right. Well, let's forge ahead. So let's, uh, as I mentioned, the first three steps we're not going to do for the book of Psalms. We're going to dive right into the fourth step uh, in this particular case. But let's say if you're studying, for example, before we do that, if you were studying the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 2 is a psalm. It is a poem. So in Jonah, you would be doing the first three steps, right? Because it's a book. And then if you're studying Jonah chapter two, you would then do the fourth step poetic analysis because he's written a poem. It's the same in Habakkuk chapter three. Habakkuk is a prophetic book. And the third chapter is actually a psalm. It has the structure of the psalm. It's it's uh, it's completely uh, written that way. So so if you're studying Habakkuk and you get to chapter three, you will be doing this poetic analysis for that third chapter because it is a psalm. All right, Exodus thirty. Uh, what is it? Thirty three. I can't remember now. Um, Song of Moses. Um, you'll see, like in. Um, Exodus and in Deuteronomy as well. Sometimes there's a poem or a psalm, like a poem that's embedded in the middle of the book. So keep that in mind as well. But since we are studying a psalm from the book of Psalms, we would jump right to this fourth step, which is the poetic analysis. Okay? Poetic analysis for Psalm 99. So now let's Let's talk about when we when we describe poetic analysis, what are the steps for that? So we're now looking at a particular psalm, Psalm 99 in this case, which we're going to read together in a minute. What's the first step of poetic analysis? Read the poem several times. Yep. We're back to the and make read observations. The, the poem several times and make observations. All right, so um, let's do that. Let's read Psalm 99, and I'm going to just pick a few guys. Uh, I've got the New American Standard Version on the screen, so I'm going to pick three of you, actually. Uh, brother, uh, let's see. Who can we have read here? DJ, I'm going to have you read verses 1 to 3. Pastor Jen, I'm going to have you read verses 4 to 6. And Manny, can you read verses 7 through 9? All right. All right, go ahead, DJ. All right. Psalm 99, uh, starting verse 1. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. And he is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The strength of the king loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Keep going through verse six. The 
We lost him. Oh, you're still muted there, Pastor Jen. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. Okay, good. And then Manny, verses 7 through 9. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, and yet an avenger of their evil deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For holy is the Lord our God. Okay, great. All right, so. Uh, I had asked you to, to be reading this psalm, so I'm, I'm hoping that you were able to do that a few times, because what I'd like to do is uh, just have us take a, a moment and make some observations. And what are some things that, that you observed from this particular psalm? And hopefully, you know, if you've got a Bible that you can have next to you open to this psalm so you can be looking at it. But... Uh, Anyone care to present some observations again? Any anything you see repeated? What seems to be emphasized? Is there a theme that that seems to be coming out of this psalm? Do you have any questions uh, from the psalm? Do you notice any patterns? What sticks out? Anyone want the, the theme of the Lord reigning? The theme of his of his um, rule, sovereign rule. Okay, give me a verse number. Uh, a verse, verse, yeah, in verse one. You see that also in verse four. Okay, good. Verse one, four. All right, this idea of reigning, exalted. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, even verse five. Verse five. Nine. Yep. There you go. So it seems to be spread throughout the poem, right? All right. Anything else that sticks out? Uh, the theme of God's holiness, God being holy. He is holy. A uh, holy is he. In verse three, verse five, verse nine. Okay, good. Versus and and uh, our, uh, the response that we are called for is to exalt him. It's also repeated, uh, verse five and verse nine. Okay. All right. Good. Anything else? You know that repetition, holy is he. Um, one thing that struck me is noticed how many times is it repeated in this psalm? Verse 3, verse 5. And then verse 9, right? Holy is the verse Lord. Uh, you know that that three times kind of reminded me of, of Isaiah 6. Remember? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then in Revelation 5, I think it is. Holy, holy, holy. I thought it was kind of interesting that it's repeated three times in this psalm as well. Just something that stuck out to me. Whether that was intentional or not, I, you know, I don't, we're not, we're not interpreting right now. We're just noticing things. Yeah. All right. The pastor theme also, the exaltation, the word exalt and exalted, verse 2. Um, in the last portion, verse 9, verse 5. Yep. Okay, good. Definitely this focus of exalt and even, even worship, right, is repeated a couple of times, isn't it? Yes. The word Lord is 
repeated seven times. Yeah, and Lord being capital, right? Yes. Uh, remember uh, when, let me just repeat it. How many times did you count? Seven times? Seven times. And again, remember. Verse 1, when, verse 2, verse 5, verse 6, verse 8, and 2 in verse 9. Yeah. And again, remember, when we see it in capital letters, uh, that's actually, if you remember, Lord in capital letters actually is Yahweh. Hebrew, Yahweh. All right. If it was Lord in lowercase letters, that is Adonai, Adonai. which is the idea of a master or Lord. Yahweh is his personal name okay which which comes from the idea in exodus 3 14 right of of i am uh technically yahweh the 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 construction of that's literally he is um uh yeah you is i am but uh, yahweh is more of this construction of he is but it's this idea of the eternally existent one but it's his name uh, have you guys, are you familiar with a translation that um, John MacArthur and the Master's College and Seminary is involved in right now? You guys seen that? I think they're calling it the LSD. Legacy Translation. Yeah, the Legacy Translation. And it's going to be, you know, pretty similar to the New American Standard. They're taking the New American Standard as a baseline. But one mm. significant change, to me, the most significant change is mm. going to be they're going to actually put the his name Yahweh in instead of saying wow. Lord. Wow. And, and I think that's wonderful because mm. Lord is a title, mm. right? In English, the word Lord is a title. Mm. It's a designation of a person's role or status. And certainly mm. he is Lord. He is ruler, master. But that's Adonai. Uh, mm. when, when, L-O-R, when Yahweh is written in Hebrew, and I think it's written, mm. oh, what was it? 3,000 times? I can't remember how many times it's in the. It's, mm. it's like if instead of saying, you know, Rabbi, you know, it would be like saying pastor all the time. Now, certainly, Pastor Rabbi is a pastor, but when. If I were to refer to him as Rabbi, that's different than if I were to refer to him as mm. pastor, right? Rabbi is more mm. personal. It's connected to mm. him in a more intimate way. Mm. And so when we use the term Lord as a translation of Yahweh, I think it depersonalizes it a little bit. Mm. And, for example, let me show you. Um, let me show you why this matters, uh, or one reason. Okay, can you all see my, uh, I've got scripture open. Do you see that Psalm 8? Everybody uh, see that on the screen? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Mm. There it is. All right, sorry. Mm took a while for the electrons to get over to the Philippines from the U.S. Here. Um, notice the first line. Oh, yeah. You, guys, can you see that? Mm. Yeah. Oh, Lord, our Lord. Our Lord. Now, yeah. notice the first Lord is capital letters, isn't it? See that? So that's the New American Standards way to show us that this is actually mm. Yahweh. Oh, mm -hmm. Yahweh. But then mm -hmm. notice the second reference to Lord. It's not in capital mm -hmm. letters. It's telling us mm -hmm. it's Adonai. So, I mean, yeah. let me just show you in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, here is the, the word Yahweh. Oh, Lord. And then here mm -hmm. is Adonai. Our Lord. It's two different words mm. in the original. Mm. Yahweh is his name. Adonai 
is a title, uh, a role, just like, you know, pastor is a, is a description of something you do, uh, something that, that uh, you, a position that you have, all right? But, but Yahweh is, is his name. And so I, I think, to me, that's been a big oversight for these many years with translations is instead of saying Yahweh, they say Lord. And part of what has driven that is because um, the Jews who translated the Septuagint, they began to uh, formulate this idea that they didn't want to speak the name Yahweh in case they would mispronounce it. And they thought that if they mispronounced his name, that that would be violating uh, the, the, the commandment, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Mm -hmm. And so there, it really was sort of a superstition mm. that then be propagated among the Jews so that today, you know, Orthodox Jews will not say the name. They'll just say the name. They won't say Yahweh. Um, they'll say Adonai or, or the name. Uh, because they're afraid of mispronouncing it, which really came from a superstition. Because when God said, don't take my name in vain, he didn't mean don't pronounce, mm. mispronounce it. He meant mm. what, right? He meant don't mm. use my name or invoke my name mm. either in a blasphemous way mm. or in a way that, that you're not sincerely calling on me, but you're using my mm. name in some other fashion uh, mm. and, as a means of disrespect and dishonor. So, mispronouncing it you know would not be would not be good but at the same time that's not what that command was referring to so but there's been this fear i think among translators of of doing this so i think for example so when you're translating this psalm psalm 8 you have to see mm. this a person reading the english mm. wouldn't see this mm. they would just see two references to lord but really, it's, mm. oh, Yahweh, our master. Mm. It's personal, but also it's showing respect and honor. Yeah. You see that? He's not just repeating, oh, master, oh, master. Yeah. He, he could, you know, there, there are places where something like that does take place. But in this case, we need to see that subtle difference because it, it, it's telling us, one, he first addresses God in a personal way by calling him mm. Yahweh. And then he addresses him with a term of respect, calling him master. All right. There is also the same pastor in Psalm 16, 1. I say to Yahweh, you are my Adonai. I say to Yahweh, you are my master. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, uh, replacing the Lord as Yahweh really makes a difference in, in one's interpretation of the Psalms. It, it does. I mean, we, we know that in both, both of them are references to God. So it's not like two different people, but the way he's being referenced, uh, it's important to see that distinction. All right. So just, um, and the whole reason I got off on that little tangent was because in Psalm 99, uh, mm -hmm. we see that reference to Lord as Yahweh. Okay. So it's, he's not just saying over and over, master, master, master. He's, it's a personal mm. uh, addressing mm. of God. Mm. And he even says, oh, Yahweh, our God. Mm. Yahweh, my God. All right. Mm. Okay. So that was, uh, I think it was called uh, the legacy translation. They're going to start. Is that out already, Tim? No, um, uh, I, I heard they're going to have, oh, was it the New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs was targeted to be done in the fall? And I think they're hoping for a full version by um, March or April next year, if wow. I remember correctly. So they're basically taking the American standard and, mm. and really – trying to address things like, like Lord and I think Dulos, uh, servant, they were going to translate as slave because that's the more common translation. And then, and then there'll be certain features as they go through. It's a group of uh, six or seven or eight men from different backgrounds. Uh, there's a Hebrew guy, a Greek guy, a historical guy, 
uh, uh, theological guy, you know, so they kind of have a mix of, of men from the seminary and the college. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I'm a new American yeah. standard guy and, uh, but, but I, I would love to see a translation, especially with this Yahweh that, that that's been just something I've been burdened about for a long time. It, it just, it's his name. Why, why would you, <laughs> why would you do that? So, but, um, that has, you know, the main I, the reason I brought that up was just so you could mm. note that as you, you mm. noticed rightly that the Lord's repeated seven times, but it's specifically mm. Yahweh that's repeated. Any other mm. observations that you guys picked up on? There are a lot of names, Pastor, being mentioned. A lot of names being mentioned. Yeah. What names mm. do you see? A name Jacob, Moses, Aaron, Samuel. Okay. What verses? Uh, verse 4, Jake, he mentions Jacob. Verse 6, uh, Moses, Aaron, and Samuel. Okay. And we just talked about one name. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, there are several names that uh, are mentioned in this poem. And, in fact, a connection is made between, in verse 6, between these three guys. And that was a question I had when I first read the poem. What, what is the connection between Moses, Aaron, and Samuel? Okay. You don't have to answer the question, but it's just some, again, observation. There's some things that we, to notice. And that's a question that came to my mind. The emphasis also of mountain. Mountain? Um, holy Mountain, Zion. Oh, good. Uh, what, what verses? Hmm. Uh, verse 2. Five. It always goes back to the place where God is, where he needs to be worshipped. Yeah, yeah Holy book Mountain, book. Holy Hill is on verse uh, 9, right? Yes. Uh, verse 9. Verse is in the word Zion in verse 2. Yeah, in Zion, verse 2, good. Yeah, those are both locations, right? So we think about, mm. we have to think about where is he referring to specifically? Are those mm. the same place? Um, you know, a question that came to my mind was verse 5. Uh, what is yeah, the reference to his footstool mean? All right. Pastor Tim, is the pillar of cloud uh, a place or is it considered a place? So, um, is the pillar is it a reference to a place, a place or an occasion? Or is it an occasion? Or is it, uh, or does it refer in Exodus? Right? You remember that? Yeah. All right, that's a good question. Because he mentions there, Samuel uh, mm. was among those who called on his name. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. And I'm thinking, uh, when did that happen? Mm. <laughs> uh, that's a question that came to my mind too. Verse, uh, mm. verse uh, 6 and 7. When did God speak to Samuel? question that came to my mind all right maybe one or two more observations um pastor kim i also noticed the shift between the third person in calling upon god and in uh actually referring to him as you so the psalm is in a sense uh, parts of the psalm is praying directly to god and then he is at other times he is describing god uh in the third person like in verse three uh, he he says, let them praise your great and awesome name. Then he shifts back, holy is he. In verse 4, the king is in his might, loves justice. And then he prays, you have established equity, you have executed justice. And then in verse 8, 
O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God. Uh, so he again prays to the Lord. Okay, good. Verse, uh, was that eight? Yeah, verse nine. Uh, eight. Yeah. Eight says you, and then verse nine eight. says uh, the, Lord. the Lord. So it's a... Pastor yeah, team. so there's a shift between good. Yes. Yeah, Pastor Tim, uh, you was repeated four times, and he was repeated seven times. Okay, you repeated four times. Four times. Uh, twice in verse four and twice in verse eight. Okay, and then what was the other? He is repeated he. seven times. Okay. You like to count things, don't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. He is repeated seven times. Okay, good. Okay, so these are just some examples. It'd be good to spend 20, you know, 30 mm -hmm. minutes just kind of going through the poem over and over. What questions come out? What things do you see? Um, again, we're not interpreting here. This is just sort of our getting, we're getting to know this poem. Uh, we're, we're interacting with it a little bit. All right. Now, what's the next step in poetic analysis? After we do the observations, the reading and the observations, the, the sec so the first step is read and observe. The second step is to identify the setting or the background context. Yes, the setting and the structure, which is the mm -hmm. idea is outline of the poem. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you spell this correctly? Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. Let's, let's take a moment and what is the background context of the Psalm? And when we, talk about it. it's similar in an idea of when we we're talking about the background context of a book uh, we want to understand okay what now, now we see each of these psalms are independent they have their own occasion they have their own purpose they have their own background so the, after reading and observing the psalm the, the next step is we want to okay what what is this psalm's background what prompted it who wrote it when was it written? Are there any places mentioned? Are there any people mentioned? Uh, what seems to be its purpose? I mean, those are the things that we're gonna try to address in this step. So as we look at the background context of the Psalm, let's remember something about the Psalms, and that is often the, the title can give us some of that information, okay? Uh, we talked about in class the the titles of the psalms let me let me go over to let's just look at a couple of examples uh quickly on this all right hopefully the passage will all right so let's go to so everybody see, I have uh, my my Bible software opened up. Do you guys see the Psalm 51 in yeah. front of you there? Yep. Right? So here, again, mm -hmm. the title of the psalm is sometimes the psalmist, the author actually, before getting to the body of his psalm, would write a title. And he would put in his title, or sometimes we call this a superscription, he would put mm -hmm. in it some information. So for example, in Psalm 51, we're given one, the author. This is a Psalm of David. And we're given the exact occasion when it was written. When was this Psalm written? Notice it says, right? When Nathan the prophet came to him after he'd gone to Bathsheba. So we're talking about, uh, this took place in 2 Samuel 12, right? You know the whole story, Nathan, uh, David and Bathsheba. And then after this all took place, right at the end of chapter 11, the thing that David had mm. done was evil in the sight of the Lord, mm. and he mm. sends Nathan to David to confront him in verse mm. 12. All right? And so 
in verse 12, Nathan confronts David, you know, uses that parable of the sheep and the little lamb. And then in verse 7, Nathan says to David, you are the man. It's I who anointed you. And then why have you despised the Lord by taking Bathsheba? And so it's this rebuke. And then David, verse 12, 13, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. So the guilt and the conviction hit him at that moment. I believe that night when he was in his room is when he wrote Psalm 51. Um, because it says that Psalm 51 was written after Nathan had confronted him. Nathan. All right. So, so we're, so we learn in this Psalm, um, let me go back to Psalm 51. We learn the exact occasion when this Psalm was written. So mm. we would go back to first, uh, 2 Samuel 11, 2 Samuel 12, and we have the whole historical background. All the events which prompted the Psalm. We have the occasion for the Psalm right here, just in one statement in the title of the Psalm. We know when the Psalm was written. We know why it was written. We know the circumstances that brought it about. We know who wrote it. And in the psalm, we realize who he wrote it to is just a prayer to God, right? Mm -hmm. So the title of this psalm gives us a lot of information, doesn't it? Very helpful. Uh, we could go to Psalm 50, the next psalm, Psalm 52. Again, notice the title. This is all the title of the psalm. Choir director, a masculine of David. So again, we're told it's the author. And notice, we're given the exact occasion when this psalm was written. You remember these events when, after David had gone to the high priest Ahimelech, mm -hmm. and Ahimelech had helped him. Doeg, the Edomite, mm -hmm. was there, and you know. So we're, mm -hmm. the whole story is back in First Samuel mm -hmm. uh, twenty-two here. Mm -hmm. So again, the title, you know, we praise God for this title, right? Because we now have the whole background to this psalm. Now, not every psalm, right, has a title. Uh, we go to Psalm 1. No title. Now, you see a title, this title here, that's the translators. That's not inspired, all right? Mm -hmm. That's just their interpretation. But notice there's no, there's no title in Psalm 1. One Psalm two is the same way. No title, no superscription by the author. All right. Uh, Psalm three, we have a title. Notice again, we're told who the author is, and we're given the exact occasion, which is found in this case, Second Samuel fifteen. All right. So I say all this in order to communicate the idea that. You know, when we're looking at the background context of the poem, the first place to start is to see, is there a title to this poem, is this psalm? And again, men, I'm not talking about the translator's title, mm. the morning prayer of trust in God. That, that's not mm. what we're talking about here. Mm. Uh, it's the superscription, the title mm. given by the psalmist. All right. And I think... Oh, I can't remember how many psalms. I think 116 psalms have some sort of title. There's, so there's 30-something uh, psalms, which are called orphan psalms, which don't have a title, mm -hmm. so we don't know who the author is. But most of the psalms have something, at least mm -hmm. the author. All right? Another example, Psalm. Here, we're not told who the author is, but we are told the occasion for the psalm. A psalm for thanksgiving. And if you were to look at this word, it's literally mm. thank offering. Mm. So it was a psalm that was written to be uh, sung as part of a worshiper bringing a thank offering to the Lord. Or the psalm itself, uh, some consider it as the thank offering being given to God. All right. Uh, we have a group of psalms, Psalm 120 to Psalm, I think, 134, which are called the Song of Ascents. Mm. That title tells us a lot. 
Now, now this title yeah. doesn't tell us the author, but it does tell us the purpose for the psalm. Mm. Okay, that the author intended this to be a psalm to be sung mm. during the annual three annual festivals. Okay, the uh, unleavened bread booths yeah. or harvest, uh, mm. and during those three festivals, everyone in Israel was to gather in Jerusalem. Mm. And there are there's uh, 14, uh, 15 psalms that were written with the intention by the mm. author for to be sung in that journey, particularly when they were going up to to the uh, Temple Mount. So each one mm. of these will have at least a song of ascent that tells us the author's intended purpose. And sometimes we're given a little more information. In this case, the author of this song of ascent was David. Mm. Okay. Now, sometimes in these titles, we have to um, take into account, let me see, Psalm, Psalm, I think it's 96. Now, sometimes uh, um, just writing a note to myself here. Now, in this particular, does anyone see a title to Psalm 96? No. And again, no. not talking about the translator one. No, mm. there's no title or superscription. But if you compare this psalm, a lot of the words and phrases in it are found in a song written by David on the day when the temple was commemorated right. mm. and i believe psalm 96 through 98 actually were likely written by david because they match uh, mm. many of the verses found in psalm 96 97 and 98 mm. actually are seen here in first chronicles 16 so um sometimes within the psalms you might be able to find a connection back to when it was likely written all right. So when you're studying Psalm 96, for example, uh, and recognize this feature that, oh, it looks like Psalm 96 is the same. It's found basically in First Chronicles 16. So it's likely uh, written by David when he first assigned Asaph to give thanks to the Lord. And then this is what he told Asaph that he wanted to be sung. And it the occasion was when the temple was being dedicated or the tabernacle was being dedicated by David when the, the uh, ark was brought there. So now we have an occasion, historical occasion for the psalm, even though Psalm 96, again, had no title written in it. We were still mm. able to find a connection to its background. Mm. Okay? So... Just because a psalm does not have a title, don't assume that we won't be able to find out its occasion. Now, many times there won't be a title and there won't be a way to figure out the exact historical occasion, but we find an occasion within the psalm itself. So, for example, uh, hmm. Psalm 13. We are given the author, but he doesn't tell us when he wrote it. He doesn't tell us the occasion. But as you read the psalm, he's, it's a psalm of lament, and he feels alone, he feels abandoned, and he talks about his enemy and his adversary. So it's some occasion in David's life when he's uh, under attack, whether it's when Absalom uh, staged the coup, you know, and tried to kill him, or whether it's one of the situations that he encountered with uh, Saul, who was trying to kill him, or perhaps the, the time when he was in Philistia and uh, 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 the enemies were trying to, to kill him there. We don't know the exact location, but we have a general idea that it was, it was some instance where he was being oppressed by an enemy. Okay? So, anyway, th these are the things that um, you can find some background information mm. within the psalm itself, either in the title or within the psalm, we might see some statements made that help us to understand uh, the occasion or the, the background of the psalm. 
Now, sometimes, for example, in like Psalm, there isn't really an occasion mentioned here. It's just one command given over and over and over. Praise, 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 praise right? So we don't know the specific occasion here, except maybe this was a, a song that was intended for temple worship. And so, you know, they wanted it. They're just saying, hey, everybody, bring the band. Let's play some instruments. We're going to praise God here. So, you know, and that's the focus. Um, and that's fine. Not every psalm has to have this big historical context and everything. Sometimes it's just mm. a simple message <laughs> that's being conveyed. All right. So sometimes the background context, you won't have much. Mm. All right. But we should still make every effort to try to figure out the background if we can. All right. Mm. But like in this case, this psalm, there really isn't a significant background. I mean, it mentions praising God in his sanctuary. So, you know, that might give us a little bit of indication that probably it's a uh, focus is when you're gathered at the temple. Um, but that's about it. Okay. Mm. Any thoughts or questions about this? We're talking about background context of the psalm. Anybody? Um, uh, Tim. Yeah. Uh, it, um, is it also possible to look look at um, the Psalms right after, let's say Psalm ninety nine, and or right before Psalm ninety nine, or right after Psalm ninety nine, because there's a similarity between uh, Psalm ninety nine and, as you had mentioned, from Psalm ninety six. Psalm 99, but even from Psalm 93, that seems to um, show that it, it's a type of psalm, like a royal psalm of sorts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Lord reigns. This is Psalm mm -hmm. 97, Psalm 96, sing to the Lord, tell of his glory, great is the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm splendor and majesty so there's kind of this theme of the greatness of god here the lord reigns psalm 97 um uh psalm 98 sing to the lord a new song uh this focus is psalm on 93. psalm 93 yes yeah. the lord reigns mm. uh, okay psalm nine oops sorry i went too far Yeah, the Lord reigns, he's clothed with majesty. Yeah, these are all part of uh, what are called enthronement or royal psalms. Yeah. And as I mentioned to you before, uh, there were stages in which the Psalter, the book of Psalms, was collected. Uh, David wrote a number of psalms, that most of which we find in book one and book two of, of the Psalter. Solomon also wrote a few psalms. Uh, then Asaph, who lived during the time of David, wrote several psalms. The sons of Korah, who were uh, singers appointed to uh, for temple worship or tabernacle worship in the days of David, they wrote several psalms or their descendants. So there's a, a lot of these psalms were grouped together. Uh, Hezekiah came later on, and he, he compiled num a number of the Proverbs, and he probably compiled uh, the existing psalms up to that point. And then many believe the final compiler of the Psalms may have been Ezra. Uh, nobody knows for certain, but that's, that's a, a good possibility. And so as these guys were collecting these Psalms together, uh, you know, I think there were times where they noticed certain patterns or connections between them. So Psalms 93 through 99, most of those are focused on a similar theme of God's exaltedness, uh, that he reigns, that he is... Um, is Lord on high. And so I believe the compiler, uh, noticing that similar theme, just grouped those Psalms together, all right? Um, it's possible they're written by the same person. I certainly believe Psalm 96 and Psalm 98 were written by David based on the connection to 1 Chronicles 16. And it's a good possibility that 99 uh, and 93 were as well. Uh, we, don't, we can't be as certain on those 
Uh, so they, they, I think, share commonality in regards to theme. They are possibly share in common the author. Um, but I don't think they're all part of the same psalm, nor should we connect them together as we interpret. We still need to treat them independently uh, as we interpret each psalm. But they do share some similar characteristics. Uh, perhaps the occasion was uh, similar for many of these psalms. And I think it is. Psalm 99, I believe the occasion is focused on when gathered, for wor to, gathered to, to worship the Lord, how are we to approach him? And that's the same uh, theme that we see in Psalm 96, Psalm 98, which were written when the Ark of the Covenant was brought to the tabernacle and David had this focus of exalting, giving, giving uh, worship to God. So 99 could have been also written around that same time by, by David as well. But it still has its own distinct focus um, in itself. Does that answer your question, Robbie? Or Okay. And like I said, you'll, you'll see a number of psalms sort of linked uh, or, or uh, put in sequence together because uh, they do share some commonality. Uh, with them. Like I mentioned before, if we go to, to Psalm, oh, I forget where it starts. Let me try 70. So I think it starts in 73. Notice that Psalm 73 begins a new book of Psalms, and it is a Psalm of Asaph. You see that? Psalm 73. Psalm 74, a masculine of Asaph. Same author, Psalm 75, Psalm of Asaph. Do you see that? And we could keep going. Psalm 76, a Psalm of Asaph. So notice a Psalm of, this is Psalm 77, Asaph. So the compiler collected all of Asaph's Psalms together. I think all of them are in a group together, except there's, I think, one inserted in between. But there's 12 or 13 psalms that Asaph wrote that are all grouped together. Again, that doesn't mean they're the same theme or that we should consider them all as part of a same book. But they're all independent poems that Asaph wrote that a compiler later on just collected them together since they, I believe, because they shared the same author. All right? Okay. Well, it's approaching uh, noon time. Let's do this. Uh, continue to keep reading through Psalm 99, and then next week when we get together, we're going to, Lord willing, accomplish a couple things. We'll go through the background context of this psalm, and then we will begin to look at the parallelism, review that, and then, Lord willing, go through some of the parallelism we see in Psalm 99. Okay? But I want to mm -hmm. commit to uh, keeping to our 10 a.m. to noon slot, just so that uh, I know you guys have other things you need to, to get to. And by after two hours, I think everybody's uh, head's ready to explode anyway, right? So, <laughs> but um, I, I do want to open up. Is there any final uh, questions or, or comments? I, I, hope, I hope you found this uh, helpful for review and discussion. But uh, any, any comments or questions before we uh, sign off? Um, Pastor Tim, are we, uh, throughout the workshop, are we just focus on the Psalms? Yes, for this particular workshop, we're going to focus on Psalm 99 and go through each of the steps together just for this Psalm. Um, We'll address, you know, other psalms or other aspects of poetry um, as we go through, especially if you have questions. And then, um, you know, if, of course, we don't know what the Lord has in store for the world in the next few months. But um, my desire would just be to continue doing this if, if, there, if you have time and if it's of value. So we could go to another type of uh, uh, genre. book. Uh, you know, like I said, we could do a narrative or an epistle together. Uh, let's just see where, where the Lord takes this. But um, I wanted to focus on, you know, a specific psalm for the, 
through the duration so we can look at each step again together and yeah. and uh, uh, try that see see how we yeah. how we how we do it okay praise god thank you thank you pastor. all right thank you thank you pastor. okay thank you pastor team let me ask uh yeah let me ask uh brother dj if uh you could close us in prayer and then uh